Hello, and welcome to the Captain Public Library's regular Friday program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I will be your reader and host today. While reading this week's book in the spotlight, I've been musing and imagining a great deal, a very big part of American history that simply no longer exists. The American frontier. A sense of adventure, followed by a, a sense of nostalgia, have buzzed in and out of my musings. To new Americans of the time, the American frontier must, of course, have been dreamed about, ever changing in its allure, bright and promising, then fearsome and doubted, but forever alive in the mind's eye of the more adventurous and courageous of the dreamers of east of the Mississippi River. Technically speaking, the American frontier, also known as the Old West, popularly known as the Wild West, encompasses the geography, history, folklore, and culture associated with the forward wave of American expansion in mainland North America that began with European colonial settlements in the early 17th century and ended with the admission of the last few contiguous Western territories as states in 1912. But in spirit meant so much more as Frederick Jackson Turner American historian of the early 20th century cites, and I quote, the advance of the frontier meant a steady movement away from the influence of Europe, a steady growth of independence on American lines. Well, so many fine American writers uh, lived through have shared or recorded uh, their words about the American frontier for many years. Of course, through all of the Westwood Ho movement beyond the Great Mississippi River, the confusion, antagonism, and of course, logical self protection of the Native Americans and their lands toward the new settlers was catastrophic in many ways, as recorded in books like James Fenimore Cooper's The Last of the Mohegans in 1826. Clark D. Thomas told tales about the rampaging frontier in 1939. Frederick Jackson Turner again went deeper arguing that the frontier was the scene of a defining process of American civilization. The frontier, he asserted, promoted the formation of a composite nationality for the American people. Mark Twain wrote about roughing it, in 1872, Willa Cather wrote her 1918 Great Plains trilogy, O Pioneers, which includes her most popular book by Antonia. John Steinbeck wrote his brilliant 1939 novel, The Grapes of Wrath. Later, James Michener wrote his magnificent saga of the West, Centennial, to mark the country's bicentennial celebrations in 1976. And even later, John D. Unruh penned his popular book, 
the plains across. And indeed, I think Fredrickson Jackson Turner painted the best of pictures in his 1920 essay entitled The Significance of the Frontier in American History. Allow me to quote that coarseness and strength combined with acuteness and inquisitiveness, that practical, inventive turn of mind, quick to find expedience, that masterful grasp of material things, lacking in the artistic, but powerful to effect great ends, that restless, nervous energy, that dominant individualism working for good and evil, and with all that buoyancy and exuberance which comes with freedom, these are the traits of the frontier. Thinking about the people there, as opposed to the land force. In 1923, a rich novel of the American frontier was written by, for my money, the greatest woman novelist of the hard scrabble life on the frontier plains and prairies, Willa Carter. Even though her brilliant The Prairie Trilogy, combining O Pioneers, The Song of the Lark, and my Antonia in 1918 was highly popular with readers. It was the lesser known book, One of Ours, that captured the praise of the 1923 Pulitzer Prize in Novel Committee. The moving story is of simple Nebraska farm folks and their traditional lifestyle, and how the Great War, at first seemingly far away on the old continent, eventually significantly touches them at home. But before exploring the story tool, let's consider some facts about the author. Will Carper. Black Creek Valley, Virginia, welcomed Willella Siebert Kaffa as the newest addition to the village in December 1873. Homeschooled by her mother and her grandmother, Willa shortened her name by two letters from Willella before age nine when the family relocated to Red Cloud, Nebraska. Ever an outstanding student, Carter settled in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania upon her graduation from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. She remained in the city of divine providence for 10 years, supporting herself as a magazine editor for the Home Monthly and the Daily Reader, and as a high school English teacher. In 1903, she published her first book of verse, April Twilights, and in 1905, a collection of short stories, The Troll Garden. In 1906, at the age of 33, she moved to New York City to work as managing editor of McClure's Magazine for six years. The Big Apple remained her primary home for the rest of her life, though she also traveled widely and spent considerable time at her summer residence on Grand Manan Island, New Brunswick. Finally, in 1912, she resigned from McClure's to devote herself to writing. Often drawing from the stories told to her in Nebraska by elderly immigrant women 
about their lives in Sweden and Bohemia particularly, Katha found an enthusiastic reading audience for her novels. She soon became best noted for her portrayals of the settlers and frontier life on the American plains. Over the ensuing 25, no, 35 years until her passing in 1947, Willa Cather offered in most in her 12 so often praised novels and 13 books of short fiction and poetry, a most significant viewpoint of the American frontier days through the eyes of the men, but especially the women of the day. Particularly in her frontier novels, Katha wrote of both the beauty and the terror of life. Like the exiled characters of Henry James, an author who had a significant influence on Willa Katha, most of her major characters live as exiled immigrants, identifying with the immigrant's, quote, sense of homelessness and exile, following her own feelings of exile living on the frontier. It is through their engagement with their environment that they gain their sense of community. Willa Carter's work is often marked by and criticized a bit for its nostalgic tone and themes drawn from memories of her early years on the American plains. Consequently, a sense of place is integral to her work. Notions of land, the frontier, foreign lands, pioneering, and relationships with Western landscapes are all recurrent. The Willa Katha Archive at the University of Nebraska Lincoln works to digitize her complete body of writing, including 2,100 pieces of private correspondence and published work. An amazing lady. Now to the book, one of ours, one of ours. It tells the story of the life of Claude Wheeler, a native of Nebraska around the turn of the 20th century. The son of a successful Midwestern farmer and an intensely pious mother, thus guaranteed a comfortable livelihood. Claude Wheeler nonetheless views himself as a victim of his father's success and his own inexplicable melees. While attending Temple College, Claude tried to convince his parents that attending the state university would give him a better education. His parents ignore his pleas and Claude continues at the Christian College. After a football game, Claude meets and befriends the Ehrlich family, quickly adapting his own world perception to the Ehrlich's love of music, free thinking, and debate. His career at university and his friendship with the Ehrlich's are dramatically interrupted, however, when his father, expands the family farm, and Claude is obligated to leave university and operate part of that family enterprise. Once pinned to the farm, Claude marries Enid Royce, a childhood friend. His notions of love and marriage are quickly devastated when it becomes apparent that Enid is more interested in political activism and Christian missionary work than she is in loving and caring for Claude. When Enid departs for China to care for her missionary sister, who has suddenly fallen ill, Claude moves back to his family farm. But 
As World War II begins in Europe, World War I begins in Europe, the family is fixated on every development from overseas. When the United States decides to enter the war, Claude enlists in the U.S. Army. Finally believing he has found a purpose in life, beyond the drudgery of farming and marriage. Claude revels in his freedom and new responsibilities. Despite, despite an influenza epidemic on board the transport ship and the continuing hardships of the battlefield, Claude Wheeler nonetheless has never felt as though he has mattered more. His pursuit of vague notions of purpose and principle culminates in a ferocious frontline encounter with an overwhelming German onslaught. One of ours is a portrait of a peculiarly American personality. It is the story of a young man born after the American frontier has vanished yet whose quintessentially American restlessness seeks redemption in a World War I frontier far bloodier and more distant than that which his forefathers had already tamed. In my humble opinion, as I always like to express, Unfamiliar, really, with the work of Willa Cartha, I chose one of ours for its particular theme, and of course for its Pulitzer Prize standing in 1923. I could not have been wiser. Cartha's embodiment of turn of the 20th century Nebraska, hills, plains, and prairies, and the characteristic traits of the frontier could not be richer. But the surprise comes halfway through the book when our geographical move with our hero, Claude Wheeler, to the European continent at war. Cartha more than rises to the occasion. Moving from the bucolic storytelling of the American frontier to the details and atrocities of war in a land so very, very foreign from Frankfurt, Nebraska. Her writing even matches that of Stephen King at his best. No, I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say Stephen Crane at his best. Very big difference there. It is at that point that Carla ups her literary game and earns her move into the pantheon of star quality in the early 20th century author field. I'm going to attempt in my reading today to gather both parts of that book, of her book, uh, the bucolic atmosphere of Frankfurt, Nebraska, uh, at a very young uh, man, Claude Wheeler, uh, and how different that is when we move eventually, a lot of water goes under the bridge, but when we move eventually to the transport ship, uh, transporting 1,500 young American boys uh, across the big pond, uh, to France, uh, and very, very soon thereafter, uh, into the heart of the battles. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of chapters uh, at the very beginning of the book, uh, and then jump rather quickly uh, two-thirds of the way through the book, just so you can see particularly how the style changes, um, which is was quite remarkable to me. So with chapter one, the very beginning of the book, and the name of this uh, particular section of the book is called On Lovely Creek. And Lovely Creek uh, is a very beautiful creek that 
runs through the property of the Wheeler family. Claude Wheeler opened his eyes before the sun was up and vigorously shook his younger brother who lay on the other half of the same bed. Bruno, Bruno, get away, come down and help me wash the car. What for? Why, aren't you going to the circus today? Car's all right, let me alone. The boy turned over and pulled the sheet up to his face to shut out the light which was beginning to come through the curtainless windows. Claude rose and dressed, a simple operation which took very little time. He crept down two flights of stairs, feeling his way on in the dusk, his red hair standing up in peaks like a cock's comb. He went through the kitchen into the adjoining washroom, which held two porcelain stands with running water. Everybody had washed before going to bed, apparently, and the bowls were ringed with a dark sediment, which the hard alkaline water had not dissolved. Shutting the door on this disorder, he turned back to the kitchen, took Mahaley's tin basin, doused his face and head in cold water, and began to plaster down his wet hair. Old Bahaley herself came in from the yard with her apron full of concord cobs to start a fire in the kitchen stove. She smiled at him in the foolish, fond way she often had with him when they were alone. What are you getting up to already, boy? You go into the circus before breakfast? Don't you make no noise, else you'll have a bustle down here before I get my fire going. All right, Mahaley. Clyde caught up his cap and ran out of the doors, down the hillside toward the barn. The sun popped up over the edge of the prairie like a broad, smiling face. The light poured across the close-cropped August pastures and the hilly, timbered windings of lovely creek. A clear little stream with a sand bottom that curled and twisted playfully about through the south section of the Big Wheeler Ranch. It was a fine day to go to the circus at Frankfurt, a fine day to do anything, the sort of day that must somehow turn out well. Claude backed the little Ford car out of its shed, ran it up to the horse tank, and began to throw water on the mud-crusted wheels and windshield. While he was at work, the two hired men, Dan and Jerry came scrambling down the hill to feed the stock. Jerry was grumbling and swearing about something, but Claude wrung out his wet rags and beyond a nod, paid no attention to them. Somehow his father always managed to have the wrongest and dirtiest hired men in the country working for him. Claude had a grievance against Jerry just now because of his treatment of one of his horses. Molly was a faithful old mare, the mother of many colts. Claude and his younger brother had learned to ride on her. This man, Jerry, taking her out to work one morning, let her step on a board with a nail sticking up into it. He pulled the nail out of her foot, said nothing to anybody, and drove her to the cultivator all day. Now she had been standing in her stall for weeks, patiently suffering, her body wretchedly thin, and her legs swollen until it looked like an elephant's. She would have to stand there, the veterinary said, until her hoof came off and she grew a new one, and she would always be stiff. Jerry had not been discharged, and he exhibited the poor animal as if she were a credit to him. Mahaley came out on the hilltop and rang the breakfast bell. After the hired men went up to the house, Claude slipped into the barn to see that, May, May, that Molly had got her share of oats. She was eating quietly, her head banging, and her scaly, head-looking foot lifted just a little from the ground. When he stroked her neck and talked to her, she stopped grinding and gazed at him mournfully. She knew him, and Rachel turned toes and drew her upper lip back from her worn teeth to show that she liked being petted. 
She let him touch her foot and examine her leg. When Claude reached the kitchen, his mother was sitting at one end of the breakfast table pouring weak coffee. His brother and Dan and Jerry were in their chairs and Mahaley was baking griddle cakes at the stove. A moment later, Mr. Wheeler came down the enclosed stairway and walked the length of the table to his place. He was a very large man, taller and broader than any of his neighbors. He seldom wore a coat in summer, and his rumpled shirt bulged out carelessly over the belt of his trousers. His florid face was clean-shaven, likely to be a trifle tobacco-stained about the mouth and it was conspicuous both for good nature and coarse humor and for an imperturbable physical composure. Nobody in the county had ever seen Nat Wheeler flustered about anything, and nobody had ever heard him speak with complete seriousness. He held up his easygoing jocular affability even with his own family. As soon as he was seated, Mr. Wheeler reached for the two-pint sugar bowl and began to pour sugar into his coffee. Ralph asked him if he were going to the circus. Mr. Wheeler winked. I wouldn't wonder if I happened in town sometime before the elephants get away. He spoke very deliberately with a state of Maine drawl, and his voice was smooth and agreeable. You boys better start in early, though. You can take the wagon and the mules and load in the cowhides. The butcher has agreed to take them. Claude put down his knife. Oh, can't we have the car? I've washed it on purpose. And what about Dan and Jerry? They want to see the circus just as much as you do. And I want the hides should go in. They're bringing a good price now. I don't mind about your washing the car. My preserves the paint, they say, but it'll be all right this time, Claude. The hired man haw hawed and Ralph giggled. Claude's freckled face got very red. The pancake grew stiff and new chewy in his mouth and was hard to swallow. His father knew he hated to drive the mules to town and knew how he hated to go anywhere with Jan and Jerry. As for the hides, that they were the skins of four steers that had perished in the blizzard last winter through the wanton carelessness of these same hired men, and the price they would bring would not pay half for the time his father had spent in stripping and curing them. They had lain in the shed loft all winter, and the wagon had been to town a dozen times. But today, when he wanted to go to Frankfurt clean and carefree, he must take these stinking hides of two coarse-mouthed men and drive a pair of mules that always brayed and balked and behaved ridiculously in a crowd. Probably his father had looked out of the window and seen him washing the car and had put this up on him while he dressed. It was like his father's idea of a joke. Mrs. Wheeler looked at Claude sympathetically feeling that he was disappointed. Perhaps she too suspected a joke. She had learned that humor might wear almost any guise. When Claude started for the barn after breakfast, she came running down the path, calling to him faintly, hurrying almost and always made her short of breath. Overtaking her, she looked up with solicitude, shading her eyes with her delicately formed hand. If you want, I should do up your linen coat, Claude. I can iron it while you're hitching, she said wistfully. Claude stopped licking at a bunch of mottled feathers that had once been a young chicken. His shoulders were drawn high, his mother saw, and his figure suggested energy and determined self-control. You didn't mind, mother, he spoke rapidly, muttering his words. By the way, my old cook was about to take the hides. They're greasy, and in the sun, they'll smell worse than fertilizer. Well, the men can handle the hides, I should think. Wouldn't you feel better in town to be dressed? She was still blinking at him. 
don't bother about it. Put me on a clean collared shirt if you want to. That's all right. He turned toward the barn and his mother went slowly back the path up to the house. She was so plucky and so stooped, his dear mother. He guessed if she could stand having these men about, could cook and wash for them, he could drive them to town. Half an hour after the wagon left, that wheeler put on an alpaca coat and went off in the rattling buckboard in which, though he kept two automobiles, he still drove about the countryside. He said nothing to his wife. It was her business to guess whether or not he would be home for dinner. She and Mahaley could have a good time scrubbing and sweeping all day with no men around to bother them. There were a few days in the year when Wheeler did not drive off somewhere to an auction sale or a political convention or a meeting of the farmer's telephone directors to see how his neighbors were getting along with their work if there was nothing else to look after. He often did the same. He preferred his buckboard to a car because it was light, went easily over heavy or rough grounds, and was so rickety that he never felt the most that he must suggest his wife's accompanying him. Besides, he could see the country better when he didn't have to keep his mind on the road. He had come to this part of Nebraska when the Indians and the buffalo were still about. Remembered the grasshopper year and the big cyclone, had witched the farms emerge one by one, had watched the farms emerge one by one from the great rolling page where once only the wind wrote its story. He had encouraged new settlers to take up homesteads, urged on courtships, loaned young fellows the money to marry on, seen families grow and prosper until he felt a little as if all this was his own enterprise. The changes, not only those in years made, but those the seasons made were interesting to him. People recognized Nat Wheeler and his car a mile away. He sat massive and comfortable, weighing down one end of the slanting seat, his driving hand laying on his knee. Even his German neighbors, the Yoders, who hated to stop work for a quarter of an hour on any account, were glad to see him coming. The merchants in the little towns made the enemy come through. Um, and missed, uh, the merchants in the little town about the county missed him if he didn't drop in once or so a week. He was active in politics, never ran for an office himself, but often took up the cause of a friend and conducted his campaign for him. The French saying, joy of the street, sorrow of the home, was exemplified in Mr. Wheeler, though not at all in the French way. His own affairs were of secondary importance to him. In the early days, he had homesteaded and bought and leased enough land to make him rich. Now he had only to rent it out to good farmers who liked to work. He didn't. And of that, he made no secret. When he was at home, he usually sat upstairs in the living room reading newspapers. He subscribed for a dozen or more, the list including a weekly dev devoted to scandal. And he was well informed about what was going on in the world. He had magnificent health and illness in himself and in other people struck him as humorous. To be sure, he never suffered from anything more perplexing than toothache or boils or an occasional bilious attack. Wheeler gave liberally to churches and charities, was always ready to lend money or machinery to a neighbor who was short of anything. He liked to tease and shock different people and had an inexhaustible supply of funny stories. Everybody marveled that he got up, he got on so well with his oldest son, Bayless Wheeler. Not that Bayless was exactly difficult, but he was a narrow gauge fellow, the sort of a, pr a pr prudent young man who wouldn't expect Nat Wheeler to like. Bayless had a farm implementation business 
Is it Frankfurt? Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. And though he was still under 30, he made a very considerable financial success. Perhaps Wheeler was proud of his own son's acumen. At any rate, he drove to town to see Bayless several times a week, would just stay at sales and stock exhibits with him, and sat about his store for hours at a stretch, joking with the farmers who came in. Wheeler had been a heavy drinker in his days and was still a heavy feeder. Bayless was thin and dyspeptic and a virulent prohibitionist. He would have liked to regulate everybody's diet by his own feeble constitution. Even Mrs. Wheeler, who took the men God had apportioned her for granted, wondered how Bayless and his father could go off to conventions together and have a good time, since their ideas of what made a good time were so different. Once every few years, Mr. Wheeler bought a new suit and a dozen stiff shirts and went back to Maine to visit his brothers and sisters, who were very quiet, conventional people. But he was always glad to get home to his old clothes, his big farm, his buckboard, and Bayless. Mrs. Wheeler had come out from Vermont to be principal of the High Street School when Frankfurt was a frontier town and Nat Wheeler was a prosperous bachelor. He must have fancied her for the same reason he liked his son Bayless, because she was so different. There was this to be said for Nat Wheeler, that he liked every sort of human creature. He liked good people and honest people, and he liked rascals and hypocrites, almost to the point of loving them. If he heard that a neighbor had played a sharp trick or done something particularly mean, he was sure to drive over to see the man at once. And if he had hitherto appeared, appreciated him. There was a large loafing dignity about Charles's father. He liked to provoke offers to uncouth laughter, but that he never laughed immoderately himself. In telling stories about them, People often tried to imitate all his smooth, senatorial, senatorial voice, robust but never loud. Even when he was hilariously delighted by anything, as when poor Mahaley, undressing in the dark on a summer night, sat down on the sticky flypaper, he was not boisterous. He was a jolly, easygoing father, indeed, for a boy who was not thin skinned. Let us move into chapter two for a minute here. Claude and his mules rattled into Frankfurt just as the Calliope went screaming down Main Street at the head of the circus parade. Getting rid of the disagreeable freight and his congenial companions as soon as possible, he elbowed his way along the crowded uh, sidewalk looking for some of the neighbor boys. Mr. Wheeler was standing on the farmer's bank corner, towering ahead above everybody else, chafing with a little hunchback who was setting up a shell game. To avoid his father, Claude turned and went into his brother's store. The two big show windows were full of country children, their mothers standing behind them to watch the parade. Bayless was seated, seated in the little glass cage where he did his writing and bookkeeping. He nodded at Charlie with, from his desk. Hello, said Claude, bustling in as if he were in a great hurry. Have you seen Ernest Havel? I thought I might find him in here. Bayless swung round in his swivel chair to return a plow catalog to the shelf. What would he be in here for? Better look for him in the saloon. Nobody could put buster or meaner <laughs> insinuations into a slow, dry remark like Bayless. Clark's cheeks flamed with anger. As he turned away, he noticed something unusual about his brother's face. But he wasn't sure what to give him, the satisfaction of asking him how he had got a black eye. Ernest Havel was a bohemian. And he usually drank a glass of beer when he came to town. But 
He was sober and thoughtful beyond the want of young men. From Bayliss's drawl, one might have supposed that the boy was for a drunken loafer. At, at that very moment, Claude saw his friend on the other side of the room, following the wagon of trained dogs that brought up, brought up the rear of the procession. He was he ran across, though brought up the he ran across through a crowd of shouting youngsters and caught Ernest by the arm. Hello, what are you off to? I'm gonna eat my lunch before showtime. I left my lunch my uh, wagon out by the pumping station on the creek. What about you? I've got no program. Can I go along? Ernest smiled. I expect I've got enough lunch for two. Yes, I know. You always have. I'll join you later. Claude would have liked to take Ernest to the hotel for dinner. He had more than enough money in his pockets, and his father was a rich farmer. In the winter family, in the winter family, a new thrasher or a new automobile was ordered without a question. But it was considered extravagant to go to a hotel for dinner. If his father or Bayless heard that he had been out, then uh, that he had been out there and Bayless heard everything, they would say he was putting on airs and would get back at him. He tried to excuse his cowardice to himself by saying that he was dirty and smelled of the hides. But in his heart, he knew that he did not ask Ernest to go to the hotel with him because he had been so brought up that it would be difficult for him to do this simple thing. He made some purchases at the fruit stand with the cigar counter next to it, and then hurried out along the duty road toward the pumping station. Ernest's wagon was standing under the shade of some willow trees on a little sandy bottom half enclosed by a loop of the creek, which curved like a horseshoe. Trot threw himself on the sea of sand, and uh, of sand beside the stream and wiped the dust from his hot face. He felt he had now closed the door of his disagreeable morning. Ernest produced his lunch basket. I got a couple of bottles of beer cooling in the freak, he, creek, he said. I knew you wouldn't want to go to a saloon. Oh, forget it, Claude muttered, ripping the cover of a jar of pickles. He was 19 now, and then he was terrified to go into a, into a saloon, and his friend knew he was terrified. After lunch, Claude looked out a handful of good cigars he had brought at the drugstore. Ernest, who couldn't afford cigars, was pleased. He lit one, and as he smoked, he kept looking at it with an air of pride and enduring, he, in, and turning it around between his fingers. Goodness. The horses stood with their heads over the wagon box, munching their oats. The stream trickled by under the willow roots with a cool, persuasive sound. Claude and Ernest lay in the shade, their coats under their heads, talking very little. Occasionally, a motor dashed along the road between them, and a child of dust and a smell of gasoline blew into every window. Claude could easily forget his own vexations and chagrins when he was with Ernest. The Bohemian boy was never uncertain, was not pulled in two or three directions at once. He was simple and direct. He had a number of interpersonal preoccupations, was interested in politics and history, and um, a good new inventions. Claude felt that his friend lived in an atmosphere of mental liberty to which he himself could never hope to attain. After he had talked with Ernest for a while and things that did, go, did not go right on the farm seemed less important. Claude's mother was almost as fond of Ernest as he was himself. When the two boys were going to high school, Ernest often came over in the evening to study with Claude. And... While they worked at the long kitchen table, Mrs. Wheeler brought her darning and sat next to them, helping them with their Latin and algebra. Even old Bahali was enlightened by their words of wisdom. 
Mrs. Wheeler said she would never forget the night Ernest arrived from the old country of Bohemia. His brother, Joe Havel, had give, gone to Frankfurt to meet him, and he was to stop on the way home and leave some groceries for the Wheelers. Uh, the train from the east was late. It was 10 o'clock that night when Mrs. Wheeler, was, Wheeler, waiting in the kitchen, heard Havel's wagon rumble across the little bridge over Lovely Creek. She opened the outside door and present, presently, Joe came in with a bucket of salt fish in one hand and a sack of flour on his shoulder. While he took the fish down to the cellar for her, another figure appeared in the doorway. A young boy, short, stooped, with a flat cap on his head and great oilcloth valise, such as peddlers carry, stuck to his back. He had fallen asleep in the wagon, and on walking and, in, and finding his brother gone, he had suggested they were at home and scrambled for his pack. He stood at the doorway, blinking his eyes at the light, looking. He was looking astonished, but eager to do whatever was required of him. What if one of her own boys, Mrs. Wheeler thought? She went up to him and put her arm around him, laughing a little and saying in her quiet voice, just as if you could understand. Uh, laughing a little and saying in her quiet voice, just so you could understand, well, you're only a little boy after all, aren't you? Ernest said afterwards that it was his first welcome to this country. Though he had traveled so far and had been pushed and hauled and shouted at for so many days, he had lost count of them. That night, he and Claude only shook hands and looked at each other suspiciously, but ever since, they had been good friends. After their picnic, the two boys went to the circus to a happy frame of mind. In the animal tent, they met Big Leonard Dawson the oldest son of one of the Wheeler's near neighbors, and the three of them sat together for the performance. Leonard said he had come to town alone in his car. Wouldn't Claude ride out with him? Claude was glad enough to turn the mules over to Ralph, who didn't mind the hired men as much as he did. Leonard was a strapping brown fellow of 25, with big hands and big feet, white teeth and flashing eyes full of energy. He and his father and two brothers not only worked their own big farm, but rented a quarter section from Nat Wheeler. They were master farmers. If there was a dry summer and a failure, Leonard only laughed and stretched his summer and a failure. Leonard only laughed and stretched his long arms and put in a bigger crop next year. Claude was always a little reserved with Leonard. He thought that the young man was rather contemptuous of the haphazard way in which things were done on the wheel of place and thought his going to college and met with waste of money. Leonard had not even gone through the Frankfurt High School, and he was already a more successful man than Claude was ever likely to be. Leonard did think these things, but he was fond of Claude all the same. At sunset, the car was speeding over a fine stretch of smooth road across the level country that lay between Frankfurt and the girls and rougher crowd already along the island. <laughs> Leonard's attention was largely given up to admiring the faultless behavior of his engine. Presently, he chuckled to himself and turned to Claude. I wonder if you'd take it all right if I told you a joke on Bayless. I expect I would. Claude's tone was not at all eager. You saw Bayless today? Notice anything queer about him? One eye, a little off color? Did he tell you how he got it? No, and I didn't ask. Just as well. A lot of people did ask him, though, and he said he was hunting around the place for something in the dark and ran into a reaper. Well, I'm the Reaper. Claude so looked interested. You mean to say Bayless was in a fight? Leonard laughed. Lord, no. Don't you know Bayless? I went in there to pay a bill yesterday, and Susie Gray and another girl came in to sell tickets for the fireman's dinner. An advanced man for this circus was hanging around, and he began talking a little smart. Nothing rough, but... The way such fellows will. 
The girls handed it back to him and sold him three tickets and shut him up. And I couldn't see how Susie thought so quick what to say. The middle of the, the minute the girls went out, Bayless started knocking them, said all the country girls were getting too fresh and knew more than they ought to about managing the sporty men. Well, right there, I reached out and handed him one. I hit harder than I meant to. I mean to slap him, not to give him a black eye. But you can't always relate, relegate things, and I was all over. I was hot all over. I waited for him to come back to me. <clears throat> I'm bigger than he is, and I wanted to give him satisfaction. Well, sir, he never moved a muscle. He stood there getting redder and redder, and his eyes watered. I don't say he cried, but his eyes watered. All right, Bayless, said I. Slow with your fist, if that's your principle, but slow with your tongue, too especially when the neighbors mentioned a, 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 a person. Bayless will never get over that, said Claude's only comment. You don't have to, Leonard threw up in his head. I'm a good customer. He can like it a little bit, so, little bit till the price of bandit, a binding tape goes down. In the next few minutes, the driver was escorted with trying to get up, uh, up on a long, rough hill on high gear. Sometimes he would make that hill, and sometimes he couldn't. And he was not able to account for the difference. After he pulled the second lever with some disgust and let the car idle on as she, as she would, he noticed that his companion was disconcerted. I'll tell you, Mr. Leonard, Claude spoke in a strained voice. I think the fair thing for you to do is to get out of here by the road and give me a chance. Leonard swung the steering wheel savagely to pass a wagon on the side of the hill. What the hell are you talking about, boy? You think you've got your measure of the right? But you don't give a chance first. Leonard looked down in amazement at his own big brown hands lying on the wheel. You marble fool kid. What would I be telling you all this for if I didn't want you to wear another, guy, another breed of cats? I never thought you'd got on too well with Bayless yourself. I don't, but I don't have, but I won't have you thinking you can slap the men in my family whenever you like, feel like it. Claude knew that his explanation sounded foolish, and his voice, in spite of all he could do, was weak and angry. Young Leonard Dawson saw he had hurt the boy's feelings. Young Claude, I knew your figure. Basil never was. I went to school with him. The ride ended amicably, but Basil wouldn't let Leonard take him home. He jumped out of the car with a curt goodbye and ran across the dusty fields by the light that shone from the house on the hill. As the little bridge over the, over the creek, uh, he stopped to get his breath and to be sure that he was outwardly composed before he went in to see his mother. Ran against a reaper in the dark, he muttered aloud, drenching his fist. Listening to the deep singing of the frogs and the distant listening of the dogs up the house, grew La Calma. Nevertheless, he wondered why it was that she had memoirs to feel responsible, she had sometimes uh, to be feel responsible for the behavior of people <clears throat> whose natures were wholly and antipathetic to one's own. Let me move now to the second half of the book, uh, which I think will give you uh, more of an urgency, certainly a laid back quality about the first section of the book. So let's see, uh, we are on the ship, as I mentioned. Um, traveling uh, to uh, from America directly to France um, and uh, influenza a case of influenza has struck the crew of, of 1500 men soldiers um, and we get to meet the company's first officer so B company's first officer Captain Max was so seasick throughout the voyage that he was no help to his men in the epidemic it must have been a frightful blow to his pride, for nobody was ever more anxious to do an officer's whole duty. 
Claude had known Harris Maxey slightly in London, had met him at the Eurologist and afterward, kept up a curious campus acquaintance with him. He hadn't liked Maxey then, and he didn't like him now, but he thought him a good officer. Maxey's family was poor folk from Mississippi who had settled in Nemaha County, and he was very ambitious, not only to get on in the world, but he said to be somebody. His life at the university was a feverish pursuit of social advantages and useful acquaintances. His feeling for the right people amounted to veneration. After his graduation, Maxey served on the Mexican border. He was a tireless drill master and threw himself into his duties with all the energy of which his frail physique was capable of. He was slight and fair-skinned, a rigid jaw threw his lower teeth out beyond his upper, upper ones and made his face look stiff. The whole manner, this whole manner, sense and nervousness was the expression of a passionate desire to excel. Claude seemed to himself to be leading a double life these days when he was working over Fanning, who was so still sick, and was down in the hold helping to take care of the sick soldiers. He had no time to think, did mechanically the next thing that came to hand. But when he had an hour to himself on desk, on deck, the giggling sense of ever widening freedom flashed up in him again. The weather was a continual adventure. He had never known any like it before. The fog and rain, the gray sky and the lonely gray stretches of the ocean were like something he had imagined long ago. Memories of old sea stories led to, uh, read to him in childhood perhaps, and they kindled a warm spot in his heart. Here on the Anchises, name of the ship, he seemed to begin at where childhood had left off. The ugly hiatus between had caused, had closed up. Years of his life had been blotted out in the fog. This fog, which has, which had been at first depressing, had become a shelter, a tent moving through space, hiding one from all that had been before, giving one a chance to correct one's ideas about life and to plan the future. The past was physically shut off. That was his illusion. He had already traveled a great many more miles than were told by the ship's log. When headmaster Fred Max asked him to play chess, he had to stop a moment and think why it was that game had such disagreeable associations for him. Enid's pale, deceptive face seldom rose before him unless such an accident was brought up. If he happened to come upon a group of boys talking about their sweethearts and war brides, he listened a moment and then moved away with the happy feeling that he was at least a married man on the boat. There was plenty of deck room now that so many men were ill, either from seasickness or the epidemic. And sometimes he and Albert Usher had the stormy side of the boat almost to themselves. The Marine was the best sort of companion for these gloomy days, quiet, steady, and self-reliant. And he, too, was always looking forward. As for Victor Morse, Claude was growing positively fond of him. Victor had tea in a special corner of the officer's smoking room every afternoon. He would have perished without it, and the steward always produced some special garnishes of toast, jam, and sweet basil for him. Claude usually managed to join him for that hour. On the day of their friend Tannhauser's funeral, he went in the smoking room at four. Victor beckoned the steward and told him to bring a couple of hot whiskeys with the tea. You're already wet, you know, Wheeler, and you really shouldn't. There, he said as he put down his glass, don't you feel better after a drink? Very much. I think I'll have another. It's agreeable to be warm inside. Two more. Steward, and bring me some fresh lime. 
The occupants of the room were either reading or talking in low tones. One of the Spanish girls was playing softly on the old, old piano. Victor began to pour the tea. He had a great way of doing it, and today he was especially solicitous. This scotch mist gets into one's bones, doesn't it? I thought we were looking rather seedy when I passed you on deck. I was up with Tannhauser last night. Didn't get more than four hours sleep. Claude, Claude murmured, yawning. Yes, I heard you lost your big corporal. I'm sorry. I've had bad news, too. It's not now that we're about to make a French page, a port. That dashes all my plans. However, c'est la guerre. He pushed back his cup with a long, take a turn outside. Claude had often wondered why Victor liked him, since he was so little Victor's kind. If it wasn't a secret, he said, I'd like to know how you got, how you ever got into the British Army anyway. As they walked up and down in the rain, Victor told his story briefly. When he had finished high school, he had gone into his father's bank at Crystal Lake as bookkeeper. After banking hours, he skated, played tennis, or worked in the strawberry bed, according to the season. He brought two pairs of white socks, of white pants, every summer, and ordered his shifts from Chicago, and thought he was a swell, he said. He got himself engaged to the preacher's daughter, two years after she promised. Now, two years ago, the summer, he was 20. His father wanted him to see Niagara Falls, so he wrote a modest check, warned his son against saloons. Victor had never been inside of him. Against expensive hotels, and women came up to us at the time without an introduction and sent, up, sent him off, telling him it wasn't necessary to fee porters or waiters. At Niagara Falls, Victor fell in with some young Canadian officers who opened his eyes to a great many things. He went over to Toronto with them. Enlistment was going strong, and he was an avenue of escape from the bank and strawberry field. The Air Force seemed the most brilliant and attractive branch of the service. They accepted him, and there he was. You'll never go home again, Claude said with conviction. I don't see you nothing settling down in my little Iowa town. In the air service, said Victor carefully, we don't concern ourselves about the future. It's not wise. He took out a double gold cigarette case, which Claude had noticed before. Let me see that a minute, will you? I've often admired it, a present from somebody you like, haven't it? Isn't it? A twitch of feeling, something quite genuine, passed over the airman's boyish face, and his, ra his uh, rather small red mouth comp compressed sharply. Yes, I, I want to, a woman I want you to meet. Here, touching his chin over his high collar. I'll write Maisie's address on my card, introducing Lieutenant Wheeler AEF. That's all you need. If you should get to London before I do, I don't hesitate. Call on her at home, because this card she'll receive you. She'll receive you. Claude thanked him and put the card in his pocketbook. While well, Victor lit a cigarette, I haven't forgotten that you're dining with us at, at the Savoy if we happen to London together. If I'm there, you can always find me. Her address is mine. I will rarely be a great thing for you to meet a woman like Maisie. She'll be nice to you because you're my friend. He went on to say that she had done everything in the world for him. She left her husband and given up her friends on his account. She now had a studio flat in Chelsea, where she simply waited his coming and dreamed his going. It was an awful life for her. She entertained other officers, of course, all the officers, but it was all camouflage. He was the man. Victor went so far as to produce her picture. And Clark gazed without knowing what to say at a large moon-shaped face with heavy-lidded, weary eyes. The neck clasped by a pearl collar, the shoulders bare to the matronly swell of the bosom. There was not a line or wrinkle in her smooth expanse of flesh, but only the heavy mouth and chin from the, from the waist down. Um, 
uh, across the photograph was written in a large, splashy hand, a monaigle. Had Victor been delicate enough to leave him in any doubt, Claude would have preferred to believe that his re relations with this lady were wholly of a final nature. Women like her simply don't exist in your part of the world, the aviator murmured, as he snapped the photograph case. She's a linguist and musician and all that, with her everyday living as a fine art. Life, as she says, is what one makes it. In itself, it's nothing. Where are you, where you came from, it's nothing. A sleeping sickness. Claude laughed. I don't know if I agree with you, but I'd like to hear you ask. Well, in that part of France, it's all shot to pieces. You'll find more life going on in the cellars than in your hometown, whatever it is. I'd rather be a stevedore in the London docks than a banker banking in one of your prairie states. In London, if you're lucky enough to have a shilling, you can get something for it. Yes, things are pretty tame at home, the other admitted. Tame? My God, it's death in life. What's left of men if you take all the fire out of them? They're afraid of everything. I know them. Sunday school sneaks, prowling around these little towns after dark. Victor abruptly dismissed the subject. By the way, you're pals with the doctor, aren't you? I'm needing some medicine that is somewhere in my lost trunk. Would you mind asking him if he can put up this prescription? I don't want to go in myself. All these me medicos, blah, 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 he might report it. And been lucky dodging medical inspections. You see, I don't know to get held up anywhere. Tell him it's not for you, of course. When Claude presented the piece of blue paper to Dr. Truman, he smiled contemptuously. I see. This has been filled by a London chemist. No, we have nothing of this sort. He handed it back. Those things are only palliatives. If your friend wants them, he needs treatment, and he knows where to find it. Bob returned the slip of paper to Victor as they left the dining room after supper, telling him he hadn't been able to get any. Sorry, said Victor, blushing heightfully. Thank you so much. Well, obviously, the men's relationships are crucial in this book, and they become more so as uh, we land and uh, dive right into the battle scenes uh, of the moment. Um, and uh, so, uh, as in all wars, soldiers depend on each other greatly, uh, even now that the women are, are there with them, fighting beside them. Um, and that becomes very, very significant by the end of the war. Uh, and he and this Victor become the closest of friends, even though they're from two sides of the coin, uh, but they become the best of friends. Um, and um, therein lies the last chapter, which of course I shan't tell you. <laughs> it's a well-written book. It's, a, it's a, a, perhaps a little bit of a slow read in the beginning, uh, going along with the, the bucolic setting and the farmhouse setting. Uh, but once it gets going uh, on this ship and into the war, it's quite a different book. And it's quite hard to imagine that she knew enough about such things as war to be able to write such a picturesque um, rendition. So I quite, uh, I quite recommend it. The Pulitzer Prize winning novel of Willa Carter, the only Pulitzer Prize she, she did receive, called One of Ours. I strongly recommend it. One, another one of early America's great writers. And let us move on then to next week. If I can take a couple of moments just to tell you a little bit about next week. Uh, we've had a call for biography again. We've not um, worked with biography for a while. It's been a challenge sort of boiling it all down into something where shall we read. But we're going to dive in because at the moment, uh, one of the hottest sellers on the New York Times bestselling list <laughs> is a biography, and it is a biography of someone that most people have admired uh, through the years uh, in film. I'll give you that much. It's also a, about a man. <laughs> uh, and the point of the biography, as he says in the beginning, uh, is 
to dispel all the illusions. Was that who I was? Is that who you thought I was? Is that how you thought I was? I wasn't. Kind of a biography. The gentleman himself died in 2008. It is an autobiography, which is another interesting bit. It was written uh, before he died, obviously, and a tremendous number of snippets uh, also collected from various people he had worked with over the years. Um, and it's been put together by his daughter um, to uh, finally put the project together. Uh, and it's the most fascinating. You read things from the beginning that you think that can't be him. Is that how he really felt? Well, that's a long tale, isn't it? I'll tell you that the book is called The Extraordinary Life of an Ordinary Man. The Extraordinary Life of an Ordinary Man, a memoir by Paul Newman. Indeed, Paul Newman of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and so many other films, and the husband of Joan Woodward, wonderful, wonderful actress Joan Woodward. Uh, it's New York Times bestseller, and here's what the Times says about it. The raw, candid, unvarnished memoir of an American icon. The greatest movie star of the past 75 years covers everything. His traumatic childhood, his career, his drinking, his thoughts on Marlon Brando, James Dean, Elizabeth Taylor, John Huston, his greatest roles, acting, his intimate life with John Woodward, his innermost fears and passions and joys. <laughs> Time Magazine and Vanity Fair both selected it as the best book of the year to date. Uh, and the Wall Street Journal dove in on this one, Newman at his best with his self-aware persona, storied marriage, and generous charitable activities. This rich book somehow imbues his character's pain and life with fresh technicolor. I thought that very well written. And the story behind it is starting in 1986, where he and his closest friend, screenwriter Stuart Stern, began an extraordinary project. Stewart was to compile an oral history to have Newman's family and friends and those who work closely with him talk about the actor's life. And then Newman would work with Stewart and get his side of the story, as the story goes. The only stipulation was that anyone who spoke on the records had to be completely honest. That same stipulation applied to Newman himself. The project lasted five years. The result is an extraordinary memoir culled from thousands of pages of transcripts. The book is insightful, revealing, surprising. Yes, indeed. Newman's voice is powerful, sometimes sun funny, sometimes painful, always meeting with high standard of searing honesty. And he closes with the line, the extraordinary life of an ordinary man is revelatory and introspective, personal and analytical, loving and tender in some places, always complex and profound. So if you like biography, memoirs, autobiography, uh, this is the hot uh, tamale, so to speak. <laughs> of hot tamales on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> I hope you'll join me. It's quite a fascinating book so far. Thank you very much for joining me today. If indeed you uh, enjoyed hearing about Willa Carter and her story and the story she wrote, uh, please do us a little favor and press that little icon there uh, with the thumbs up. It's a vote of confidence for us and we appreciate that very much. You may also want to share the, the icon there for sharing it with a friend. And of course, there is a section for comment uh, below. So please do offer a comment, some small story you might know about Willa Cartha or your favorite book, um, or perhaps even your favorite book that isn't Willa Cartha. <laughs> Any book that is your favorite book, we're placing uh, the September list together at the moment. So if you do have a favorite book and you'd like to hear it on the program and the story behind it, 
uh, then please let us know. And finally, there's one other icon that's bigger than all the rest, and it is subscribe. Normally, subscribe requires money, doesn't it? Even if it's a reduced rate, six months, and then an exorbitant rate for the rest of your life. <laughs> this is not that. There's no money involved. Simply a question of sharing your email address with us so that we can send you updates on programs at the Camden Public Library, of which during the summer there are oodles of them. Uh, it also gives us a, a vote, a vote this time of confidence, but a vote across the state of Maine. All of the public libraries across the state of Maine are in a competition and have been for some time uh, to reach the number one spot as the with the largest number of subscribers to their uh, YouTube channel in the programs world of the library. Um, and we are a rather small library in Camden, a rather picturesque library, as most people love to take photographs of it when they're in town. Uh, but we are currently, and have been for several months, number one in the state of Maine. We're very pleased about that, as you can tell. Um, and even some of the larger libraries, public libraries in the states, so larger cities that have a much bigger population, um, we are still number one and have been for uh, 10 months, I think. Today's program is number 145. We have been uh, placing these programs every Friday for, well, now almost three years. Um, so uh, I think that has helped us in getting votes of confidence. So please do subscribe. We'd love to have the vote. Again, thank you very much. I hope you're enjoying the summer. The weather is a bit dramatic at times, a bit topsy-turvy at other times, and a bit spectacular at too few number of times at the moment, but hopefully it will improve and stay consistent. Take care of yourself during the coming weeks. Stay healthy. There are germs going around always, especially when our town has multiplied by three with all of our wonderfully welcome tourists. And of course, if you have the choice, be happy, be positive, and try not to be unpleasant. Thank you so much. Goodbye.